Hello, my friends, and welcome to another video. My name is Devlin Peck, and I help instructional designers learn new skills and land opportunities, which is why today we're going to take a look at the top five portfolio mistakes that people make that may wind up actually costing you the job. So I have plenty of examples lined up for us here. I have actually pulled them all from my portfolio showcase. So these portfolios are all people that I've worked with in my bootcamp program. If you haven't checked it out before, then you can check it out at devlinpeck.com slash showcase. So the first mistake we're going to dive into is not including projects on your homepage. So the reason this is a mistake is because people going to your homepage are probably only there to see your projects. I mean, you know, if someone's going to your portfolio link from a resume or from your LinkedIn profile, they want to see the quality of the work. They want to see what you're capable of. And to do that, they want to see projects. So what I mean by that. Um, here we are on Raul's portfolio. Notice if we scroll down, we immediately get into a featured project with a button to learn more and actually dive into that project. Cassie's site as well. As soon as we have that hero section with the header, we can scroll down and we can see the project. And then so on, you know, you could see this example again with Alex Hoffman's site. We scroll down, we can see his work and we can click on one of these projects to learn more. So it's a pretty... It's a pretty like simple thing when you think about it or when you pay attention to it, but I've seen a lot of portfolios from people where it's just like, hi, my name is Devlin and like that's all that's on the homepage, maybe a little bit of info and then we have to like go up into the nav bar to get to the portfolio page, which is where the projects live. So don't make that mistake. Again, this one is probably not going to be like super extreme costing you the job, but if you can include some projects on your homepage, especially right after a hero section, um, it's going to make the user experience better for hiring managers, recruiters, potential clients, and even other people in the field who want to see what you're capable of. So that will probably be a common trend throughout some of these tips. We just want to make it easier for people to use, easier for people to um, engage with your content and see what it is that you're capable of. So the second mistake that people make is not including write-ups for their projects. And I'll quickly show you what I mean by the write-up. I have a full video about how to do the write-ups if you haven't seen it before, but if we click on one of these projects, we can see who the audience is. We can see what role you had in that project as well as which tools you used. And then we can see a full breakdown of your process. So here we are. I'll go to David's site here. If I click on one of these projects, I'm going to get a very full, um, full write-up. So again, audience, responsibilities, tools used. We have a link to actually dive into the full project, but then we can see this, you know, we can actually see the full process. We can see the deliverables broken down. We have screenshots included throughout. So again, you, you could check out the full video on the, the process write-ups, which I'll, I'll link below. But the reason we do this is because a lot of hiring managers and potential clients want to know what role you actually played in the projects on your portfolio, because it's, more common than you would imagine where people include projects that they've worked on with with teams um, and they may have only contributed a very small part to that project and so hiring managers and recruiters can be a little bit um, skeptical if they if you just bring them directly into a project that looks really good they might be like well what role did you play in this did you just do the voiceover did you do the graphics did you do the writing or did you do all of it so you definitely want to make that clear and um, you also want to justify your design decisions so that you're not just showing off the final project, which I always say like the final project, the actual deliverables, that's only like 50% of the portfolio project. Um, the other 50% is this write-up where you can show off your thinking and your process and your design decisions and the, the role that you held. So keep that in mind. We definitely do not want to skip the process write-up. That is a big part of the portfolio project. All right. Common mistake number three is not including any storyline projects. So I see this a lot. People will include projects um, from maybe their experience in the education space or their experience teaching, and they'll they'll include some some beautiful slide decks and some um, well designed um, like face to face learning experience materials, possibly maybe some animated videos. But hands down, Articulate Storyline is the most popular tool in the corporate instructional design space. So if you're trying to get a corporate ID job, it is a big mistake to not include a project like that. Oh, I had I had Nicole's site pulled up here too, just another good example of a, of a process write-up. But um, let's get back into storyline. So I did this survey in 2021 asking 101 hiring managers which three tools 
instructional designers should be familiar with upon hire. So 101 hiring managers, mostly in the corporate space. Which tools should I be, IDs be comfortable with upon hire? 86% of them said articulate storyline, which is massive. And you can see that the closest runner-ups were learning management systems and Microsoft PowerPoint, which are both under 50%. So most of the people responding to the survey said, yeah, if we're hiring an ID, they should be familiar with storyline when we hire them. And this, and this reflects my experience in the field since 2017. Um, and, it, and it reflects my experience from people saying, hey, I have this portfolio. I'm not, I'm not having any luck getting any work. They don't have storyline projects in it. So if you want to show off to a hiring manager or recruiter or potential client that you can hit the ground running as soon as you get started, odds are their team is using storyline. So if you can show off some direct experience and expertise with that tool, it's going to go a long way. All right. Mistake number four is not having any personality on your portfolio site. Okay, so we don't want your portfolio site to be forgettable or to look like everyone else's. Um, and a really good way to um, counter that and to make your site more memorable is to incorporate some personality into it, to make it a bit more unique and true to who you are so that, um, yeah, you're kind of reinforcing who you are as soon as people land on your website. So let's see some examples here. Um, I mean, you've already seen some examples So you can see on on Nicole's site, even she has these like banners with the circles on them. She uses circles a lot, even for the navigation. Like this is very unique and this nice, unique display cursive font for her last name. So we've got some personality there. Um, let's just move along. OK, so Kristen's site. So I did a portfolio review of Kristen's site recently. You could check out the full video if you want, because this is a really solid site. But notice like the colors that Kristen incorporates and just these lines, right? So she incorporates them throughout all of the pages, throughout most of the sections, but it adds some personality. It makes the site a bit more playful. It's not, it doesn't take itself so seriously and it definitely makes it unique and memorable and not just the shapes, but also the color. So you have really good, you, you know, incorporating those, those colors throughout the site, as you can see here, you know, some font choices to make the site have a bit more personality. Um, so just a really solid example of small things you can do to make your site feel a bit more unique. So here's Steve's site. Um, really, again, really good job with the colors and with the shapes. So you can add a lot of personality with colors and shapes. Notice Steve says, I make fun and immersive e-learning solutions. And and the the design re reinforces that, like the, the personality that Steve is incorporating here. So... Very well done. Again, the logo reinforces it as well. Nice colors, nice shapes, and it's very consistent throughout. And then I want to show you another example. It's kind of goes in a different direction. So this is Laura's site and it's very minimal and it doesn't have a lot of color and it doesn't have a lot of shapes, but it has a lot of negative space. So look at all of this white space. Again, there's not a ton on here for us to work with, but this alone can reflect your personality, like not having a lot of extra colors or shapes or things like that. It keeps it very focused. It says, yeah, Laura is very focused, ready to get down to business. Um, and also perhaps very intentional because it does seem like an intentional amount of white space with how much white space there is here. And it is consistent. If you're consistent with your design decisions, that's going to tell a lot about how intentional you are. So there are some examples of different ways you can incorporate personality on your website. Of course, you can do that with photos of yourself, illustrations that are like all cohesive. Um, just think about the story you're trying to tell, the mood you're trying to evoke in your audience. And um, just think about whether or not it's true to who you are so that when you do hop on that interview or that call, the person feels like they already know you because they've been on your site and they've, um, they've, yeah, they've, they've received the message that you were trying to send with those design decisions that you made. And then finally, the last common mistake that I see people make is that they include confusing navigation on their sites. If the user experience is clunky or if you confuse people, you lose. I like that saying. If you confuse, you lose. Um, so I think the most common way I see this as a mistake is that people kind of include pictures for their like portfolio projects and they expect people just to know to like click on those pictures to access the portfolio projects. And let's dive into the examples. So notice here, just on Laura's site, we have these very clear buttons, see more. Like, I guess the common mistake I see is not including a button here and expecting people to know that if they click on this photo, that it's going to bring them into a write up, like clicking this button actually does. Um, so once again, here we are on Teresa's site. So we have this really solid get to know me button. 
Um, again, and look at the personality here too, even like these, um, these underlines. So these underlined words, that's not something you see on other sites. So interesting there. Notice Teresa didn't use full buttons for these projects, but she did include like a text-based hyperlink. So buttons are even more clear. That's what I usually recommend, including a nice big button that people can't really miss. Um, like here we are on Joanna's site, for example, really big button, learn more about me. We go there, we can see some nice photos of Joanna and learn more about her story. And this is the other piece of communi confusing communication. We don't want to end our page just in nothingness. Like if we end the, if we, we want to lead the person from one page into the next page. So Joanna in this case brings us back to her portfolio. If we learn more about one of her projects and scroll all the way down through the write up, Joanna will probably be sending us somewhere afterwards. Yeah, view the next project or let's chat. So two really solid call to action so we can keep exploring her portfolio or we can chat with her. And Alex's website is really similar as well. We have the get to know me link so we can go there. We can learn more about Alex. We have all of the photos and then we can get brought right back to the portfolio site. We scroll down. We can, of course, dive into one of the write ups. It's a long write up. So I'm going to scroll through all of this. And once again, we have a call to action to experience the project, which will actually bring us into it. Or we can connect with Alex, which brings us to the contact form. So two things to keep in mind. Don't be afraid to use big buttons like this. You can see on my site as well, I use a lot of them. And then also when at the end of each of your pages, whether it's a write-up page or an about page or even your home page, make sure that you're intentionally sending your audience somewhere afterwards just so they don't get to the bottom of the page and they're like, okay, well, I don't really have anywhere else to go. Maybe I'll scroll back up and, and find somewhere to go or maybe I'll just get off of this site and go somewhere different. So those are my tips. Um, again, feel free to check out the portfolios if you'd like and see how these different tips are applied and try applying them to your own portfolio as well if you already are at that point. Um, if you would like to work with me like pe the people who did all of these portfolios um, have in the bootcamp, then you can learn more about the bootcamp at idbootcamp.com and I'll help you with your portfolio site, your job search, your freelance opportunities, all of the above. Um, and then if you're looking for more YouTube videos, I do have a full video on how to build your instructional design portfolio, which will probably be quite helpful for you. So keep up the good work and I will see you in the next video.